بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Tonight we'll be continuing our Family Night series on easy good deeds uh, Tonight we'll be covering 21 through 25 um, In total there are I believe 81 good deeds that are mentioned So tonight will be 21 through 25 Insha'Allah So I'll go over them uh, one So I'll list them out one by one And then we'll, we'll go through them um, Piece by piece, inshallah. So number 21 is being soft-spoken. 22, reconciliation. 23, supporting orphans and widows. 24, spending on one's family. And 25, good conduct with parents. Uh, we'll start with number 21, inshallah, being soft-spoken. And this, this section, uh, it's not just about being soft-spoken specifically, but to generally uh, be kind, basically. Uh, we have a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha She narrates that the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah is kind and loves kindness He grants upon kindness what he does not grant upon harshness And what he does not grant upon anything besides it So this clear, uh, clearly shows us the, the, the beauty of kindness And the Arabic word for that that's mentioned here is rifq Allah, Allah loves kindness. Allah loves, Allah loves it when a person uh, is, uh, is gentle, subhanAllah. In another narration also from Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, kindness is not found in anything except that it adorns it, and it is not removed from anything except that it tarnishes it. And this, uh, this section, this, this action item, it really uh, shows us that you know, our deen is very well-rounded, subhanAllah. It's very well-balanced. It's such a, such a beautiful deen. And we ask Allah, Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik. We ask Allah, the turner of hearts, to keep our hearts firm on this deen. Amin rabbil alameen. And so you notice from this how comprehensive our deen is. It's not just about certain things, and it's not just about other things, but it's a, a total package, right? So there's the balance between having a good relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal as best we can, and then also trying our best to have uh, uh, good relationships with, um, so to be good with God, and then to also to be good with God's creation. We have this, uh, the balance between the vertical and the horizontal, so to speak. This shows us that it's not, it's not just about uh, praying, for example, and fasting and reading Quran, which is good. Right? But if a person is praying and they lack kindness, that's an issue. If a person is fasting and they lack kindness, that's an issue. If a person is reading Qur'an, connecting with the Qur'an, and they lack kindness, that's also an issue, a major issue. So the more a person prays, what should happen is they should actually increase in kindness if they're truly benefiting from their prayer. The same with their fasting and the same with, uh, with the Qur'an. The Prophet actually criticized people who would... Uh, pray a lot in comparison to the Sahaba. They would fast a lot in comparison to the to the companions, and they would read Quran. But the Prophet specifically described them as the Quran would not pass their throats; it would not go further than their throats. They would read a lot of Quran, but it wouldn't impact their hearts. It wouldn't impact their character. They did not become more kind as a result of it. Actually, ironically, and this shows their backwardness. They actually became more harsh the more they prayed and the more they fasted and the more uh, they, they read Qur'an. SubhanAllah. So clearly, that had the opposite effect of what, of, of what it should have, right? So it, it shows you something, right? The, these are the khawarij. May Allah protect us. They would, they, the Prophet told the Sahaba that you're, you're going to come across a group of people that you would you would think that your prayer is very little in comparison to theirs. Your fasting is very little in comparison to theirs. And they would read the Qur'an, it would not go further than their throats, and they would leave this deen like an arrow, like an arrow leaves uh, the bow, subhanAllah. May Allah protect us from that. So if a person is praying, but there's a lack of kindness, that's a major issue. Things are, are being done backwards, right? Same with fasting and, and Qur'an. So this... This section, it really reminds us the importance of, uh, of being soft-spoken specifically and then kindness in general. In another narration from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet said, May Allah have mercy on a person who is lenient 
when he sells, lenient when he buys, and lenient when he demands. Now, of course, this needs to be understood properly in a balanced fashion, because if a person, if they have a business, and every time, if everyone came to them and every time someone asked them, you know, for a favor or for this or for that, then they're going to go out of business. This has to do with, you know, with um, uh, specific situations. So in general, you know, yes, you have your business and you have, you need to meet the bottom line and you need to go about things in, in, a, uh, in a certain way. Um, but, you know, if there are times when, you know, maybe, so think of like having a sale, like, okay, that's a little leniency when, when you're selling, that's good, right? People may take advantage of that and they can benefit from that. Um, and then also leniency when, uh, when you buy. So th this is like adab in the marketplace, right? The manners in, 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 in business, manners in the, uh, in the marketplace and, and the importance of, of having a, a uh, not to be taken advantage of, that being said, to have a, uh, a type of tenderness, a type of softness in, uh, in the heart. And we know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had high praise for the, uh, for, for the honest uh, business person, SubhanAllah. Uh, we have another, another narration that says, in which the Prophet said, one of Allah's servants whom, whom he had given wealth will be brought to him. He will ask him, what actions did you do in the world? He will say, oh, my Lord, you gave me wealth. I used to trade with people, and one aspect of my character was to forgive. I used to be lenient with the wealthy and grant respite to the poor. Allah will say, I am more worthy of this than you. Addressing the angels, he will say, forgive my servant. SubhanAllah. So look at the, 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 the high reward for this person, SubhanAllah. Uh, in, a, in another narration, the Prophet said, whoever gives respite to a poor person or reduces his debt for him, Allah will shade him on the day there shall be no shade besides his. SubhanAllah. So imagine uh, someone is very wealthy and there's a poor person, someone struggling who owes them a little bit of money. The idea is to be uh, uh, lenient with, uh, with this person uh, if possible, inshallah. In another narration, the Prophet, he says, وسلم, whoever, whoever it pleases that Allah should save him from the anxieties of the day of judgment should alleviate the difficulty of a person in difficulty or reduce his debt. SubhanAllah, how many people actually go and do this? If they know someone, maybe there's a family member in debt. How many people actually go and help them with their debt? And vice versa, how many people are in debt to family members, right? Even if that family member is very wealthy and very comfortable, they still insist that you owe me $35, subhanAllah. Right, so, so let's take this into uh, consideration, inshallah, and look at the high reward. If someone's in difficulty, you help them out. Uh, if someone, uh, or if someone is, let's say someone is in debt to someone else and you help them to pay off their debt, right? Imagine the, the, the status of this person with Allah Azza wa Jal. Moving on to number 22, reconciliation. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَى فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ All believers are, are but brothers, therefore seek reconciliation between your two brothers. Uh, Allah also says, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَأَصْلِحُوا ذَاتَ بَيْنِكُمْ So fear Allah and set your relations right. SubhanAllah. Uh, in a, let's see here, in a, uh, a narration from the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, the liar is not one who reconciles between people and thus conveys or says a good word. This has to be done with wisdom. A person can't just go to person A and say, hey, you know, person B, they said they're like really sorry about whatever. And like, there has to be wisdom. They, they need to understand who's person A. For example, let's say two people. Who's person A? Who's person B? What are their personalities like? And what do I think is going to work with this person? What's going to work with that person? And it would, of course, depend on the uh, the nuances found, the details found within that situation. Uh, there's another very important narration in which the Prophet, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, being fair between two people is a charity. Again, we find the Prophet telling us, teaching us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that charity is something much more than financial, as good as that is. We just talked about if someone is in debt and you help someone to pay off their debt, right? This, is, this has a very high status with Allah Azza wa Jalla. Right? Imagine the reward of doing that, of helping someone to pay off their debt, subhanAllah. Sadaqah is not something just financial, as good as that is, as important as that is. Uh, 
uh, and we'll get to this later, the very next section, supporting orphans and widows. But we have in, in many examples of the Prophet teaching us that there are uh, many more options when it comes to sadaqah than just the financial side of things, right? Dhikr is a type of sadaqah. Uh, every subhanallah is a charity. Every alhamdulillah is a charity. Removing some, something harmful from the road is a charity. And what's mentioned here, and also trying to rectify between two people is a charity. Now, we need to keep this in mind, and this, this needs to be sprinkled with, um, with wisdom. Let's say someone, uh, for example, let's say someone uh, owes somebody uh, $100,000, for example. Let's say these two, they're, they're, they're you know, both well off and they're both very wealthy, and one person uh, owes another person $100,000, and they're very capable of paying it off, for example, but they refuse to. They're just they're just being stingy. They're just being uh, greedy. They're they're being dishonest. They can pay the money back, but they're just they're refusing to. They're they're being very tough in this in this situation. And let's say someone is trying to reconcile between them. Let's say these are all family members. For example, you have one family member who owes the other family member hundred k, and both let's say both are very well off. Uh, especially the one who owes the other one that money. And so another family member, let's say, uh, you know, they, they want to reconcile the situation. So how should they do that? Do you go to the person who's owed $100,000 and you tell them, look, just forgive, you know, let the, the 100K go. And, and no, you don't do that. What do you do? You go to the person who owes the money and you talk to them. You don't put the pressure on the one who's owed that money that, hey, you have to forgive, so on and so forth, go to the one who owes the person that money, go put the pressure on them, right? Because they're not being just. That's how uh, you're fair between these two people. That's how you rectify between these two people, right? Sometimes what happens, unfortunately, in the Muslim community is people go to the, the abused and they put pressure on them and they put no pressure on the abuser. This has to be kept in mind when it comes to this type of uh, situation. Moving on to number 23, supporting orphans and widows. Uh, in the Quran, there's a verse, uh, they ask you about the orphans. SubhanAllah, look at, this is one of the, the concerns of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. May Allah be pleased with them. Look at how beautiful this, this generation uh, of people is. They, they went out of their way to ask the Prophet, about how they should treat orphans, like advise us. Because this was a concern of theirs. Look at what they're concerned with. Ya Allah, uh, uh, excuse me. Ya Rasulullah, we want to like help the orphans, you know, advise us. This shows where their hearts were at, right? They were concerned with what? With helping the orphans. They ask you about the orphans. Say to work for their good is good. SubhanAllah. Uh, in a narration from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I am the one, the Prophet is saying this keep, keep this in mind The best of creation Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying this I and the one who looks after an orphan Will be like this in paradise He indicated with his index and middle finger Keeping a small gap between them Subhanallah So look at the, the huge reward For looking after an orphan Subhanallah Right, so if you have not given charity recently through whichever organization to help orphans, I advise you to do that as soon as you can. You know, do so tonight, do so today, do so tomorrow. The trick though is if a person says, okay, I'm going to do it tomorrow, and they have a lot of stuff going on, right? It's on, on a realistic level, it's very easy to forget. So, you know, if you're watching this now, if you're listening to this now, maybe consider pausing it. Go give some money. Uh, to, uh, to, to help some orphans and then come back and finish, inshallah. We ask Allah to make this a beneficial reminder. We don't just want to learn these things. We want to try our best to, uh, to practice them as best we can. مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ To have taqwa of Allah as much as we can based on our uh, individual capacity. In terms of widows, uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet said sallallahu alayhi wasallam. One who spends on a widow or needy person is like the mujahid, subhanAllah. 
The narrator adds, I think he also said, and he is like one who constantly stands in salah, in prayer, without a break, and like one who fasts continuously. SubhanAllah. So look at look at the high status of someone helping a widow. Right? We also need to keep in mind that if that if someone helps, let's say there's an orphan who lives with their mother, because the orphan would technically be the one who loses their father. So you helping that orphan, you're actually helping both because by helping the orphan, you're also helping the orphan's mother in that example. So you're actually helping both. Because what it, what is the mother's main concern? What is the main thing on the mother's mind to take care of her child, subhanAllah? This is the amazing, incredible rahmah, mercy that, that Allah has, has placed in, um, in the, the, the hearts of mothers, generally speaking, subhanAllah. Uh, yes, unfortunately, you have some, some horror stories. We ask Allah to protect us from that, but this is generally speaking. By helping that orphan child, you're also helping the mother because that can, because if she gets some money, the primary concern is to help the child. So if you help the child, then that frees things up for the mother a little bit financially. And there's, of course, a huge reward uh, in, in doing so. The Prophet, he also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best house among Muslims is one in which an orphan is treated well, and the worst house among Muslims is one in which an orphan is mistreated. So you have the Prophet like the being this flag bearer for justice, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet is concerned with a vulnerable person, in this case an orphan, being treated well or being mistreated. The orphan is very vulnerable. So if a person is good to this vulnerable person, that is something extremely praiseworthy. And if someone on the flip side takes advantage of a vulnerable per, of a vulnerable person, then the Prophet highly criticizes this person. In this case, what's specifically mentioned is an orphan. So you have the Prophet standing up for the vulnerable, encouraging people, help the vulnerable, help the orphans, help the widows, help those in need, help those who are who are struggling, help the refugee, for example. To help those, um, to help those who are uh, disadvantaged, to help those who are, who are vulnerable. Uh, in terms of action item number twenty-four, uh, spending on one's family. And and this is something that's often overlooked. A person, if they if they think of charity, they often think of, like what like what we just mentioned, giving charity to help orphans, giving charity to help widows, which is awesome without question. We just covered that. May Allah accept everyone's efforts. So think of that as, for example, outside of the home, but don't forget charity within the home, spending on one's family, right? This is something uh, very important. The Prophet, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a dinar, which is a type of currency at the time of the Prophet, a dinar which you have spent in Allah's cause, a dinar which you have spent to free a slave, a dinar which you gave in charity to a poor person, and a dinar which you spent upon your family. The greatest of them in reward is the one you spent on your family. Allahu Akbar. The Prophet is teaching us that Islam starts at home. Islam starts within your immediate proximity. So the person ideally would look within themselves and, and then after they do that to look at their family and then uh, to look outside of that. Because if a person, if they're helping if they're helping strangers, if they're helping people they may not know, if they're donating to organizations to help people overseas, that's, that's really good. But if they're doing that, but then they're neglecting their own children, if they're neglecting their own spouse, that's a huge problem, subhanAllah. Some people, they may give thousands to help people overseas, but then they're not helping their own spouse, excuse me, they're not helping their own children. In some cases, they may not be helping their own uh, their own parents, subhanAllah. So we need to prioritize, especially based on what the Prophet just mentioned here, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Out of all these different things, again, to generally spend in Allah's cause, uh, to free a slave, to give charity to uh, a poor person, and to give to your family, the Prophet said the greatest of them in reward is the one you spent on your family. SubhanAllah, this hadith is found in Muslim. Such a, such a beautiful practice 
to never underestimate. So someone, if they go out and they buy groceries, right? If they, if they cover the cost of that family dinner, you're rewarded for that. You're rewarded, and we'll, we'll get to this in a second. You're rewarded for that, subhanAllah. The mother of the believers, Umm al-Mu'mineen, Sayyida Umm Salama, radiallahu anha, asked the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa if she will be rewarded for spending on her sons from her previous marriage to Sayyidina Abu Salama. They are her own, her own sons, uh, after all, and she cannot just abandon them. The Prophet ﷺ replied, yes, you will be rewarded for what you spend on them. Allahu Akbar. And this is what uh, something that I especially wanted to get to, just because this really drives the point home. I just spoke about like family dinners and grocery shopping, and you're rewarded for all of that, paying for the electricity bill. You're rewarded for that, right? Um, all these different things around the house that we often overlook, right? There's, there's reward in that, so that should be something appreciated. Uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, one of the, the, uh, the special all-star team of 10 companions, one of the 10 uh, promised Jannah, all at once by the Prophet Sallallahu by name. He narrates that the Prophet Sallallahu said, you do not spend anything whereby you seek the pleasure of Allah except that you will be rewarded for it. Even the morsel you place in your wife's mouth, SubhanAllah. So you're rewarded not just for generally providing food, but for every bit of food. Like every, th think, of, think of like, you know, every grain of rice. Think of uh, every drop of water. All these things are rewardable. Um, so th this is not something to be, taken, to be taken lightly. So you have this encouragement from the Prophet. Islam starts at home, right? Take care of your family, right? Lock that in. And then once you do that, inshallah, move on from there and uh, help help others as best you can. We ask Allah to make us from uh, among those who try their best to work on their relationship with God and with His creation. We ask Allah for guidance and tawfiq. Uh, number 25, uh, good conduct with parents. Uh, in the Quran, Allah says, worship Allah and do not associate with, with Him anything. And be good to parents. Elsewhere, Allah says, we have instructed man to do good to his parents. One time, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, a great companion, he asked the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which action is most beloved to Allah? Right, so you, you find him here aiming for the A+. plus. He's not asking the Prophet, like, if I get a D-, minus, can I still pass the class? You know, it's not a C, but it's also not an F. Can a D minus? Okay, what if I get a C minus? Is that okay? Technically, a C minus is passing. But Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he, he wants that A plus. And he was definitely an A plus companion in his own right, radiallahu anhu. So he asks the Prophet, what action is most beloved to Allah? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, performing prayer at its correct time. Praying on time. He then asked, then what? The Prophet replied, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, being kind to one's parents. He further asked, then what? He replied, performing jihad in Allah's cause. So struggling for the sake of Allah. And Ibn Taymiyyah, he mentioned that, you know, every act of qurba is, uh, is a struggle, is its own jihad. The struggle to come closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu anhumah narrates that a, a person came to the Prophet and expressed his desire to participate to participate in, in a jihad expedition for the pleasure of Allah and to attain reward. The Prophet asked, look at this, the Prophet asked, are your parents alive? He replied, yes. They are alive. The Prophet said, go and serve them well. In, a, in another narration, he said, perform jihad by serving them. So this ties in with the, the quote from, from Ibn Taymiyyah, that every act of coming closer to Allah is jihad, is a, is a struggle. SubhanAllah, so these, these different 
uh, references from, from the Quran and from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, show us the, the rank of parents. And we also need to keep in mind that this is regarding like generally healthy functional situations. If there's abuse, whenever there's abuse, that always changes things. So I don't want this, I don't want this to be taken out of context that if someone is dealing with severe abuse, major abuse from one or perhaps both parents, that's different. So these references, they refer to what we can call the norm. So you have, uh, you, have, you have norms and you have exceptions. So these would refer to norms. And then whenever there are uh, exceptional circumstances, whenever, uh, there's, whenever there's abuse, for example, that, that shifts it from uh, the norm to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the exception. So if there is someone dealing with major pain from one parent or both parents, we ask Allah to heal that pain and we ask Allah to help them in their journey of, uh, of healing and recovering. Uh, and as it relates to that, it's definitely better for a person uh, to, to speak with a therapist as opposed to an imam, for example, right? Because they're, they're just, they're different realms, right? So the job of the imam, if someone goes to an imam and tells an imam that they've gone through major abuse, for example, from a parent, the job of the imam is to refer that person to a trustworthy, a trusted, a, a good therapist, basically. Right? Because that, that's their expertise, and that is um, so the, there are two different fields, essentially. And for, for whoever has that, uh, that pain, we ask Allah to heal it and to replace it with something better. In this life and the next, I'm going to be the uh, Moving on to, <clears throat> excuse me, moving on to the, uh, to the next reference here. Uh, Allah mentions, uh, excuse me, before I get to the verses, uh, we have a hadith in which a person came to the Prophet and asked, O Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is most deserving of my good conduct? The Prophet replied, your mother. He asked, then who? He replied, your mother. Again, he asked, then who? He replied, your mother. When he asked a fourth time, the Prophet replied, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, your father. Right? So your mother, your mother, your mother, your father. That, this is where that, that comes from. And again, the disclaimer, we need to take this, um, uh, to take this into consideration if there's abuse. If someone has dealt with major abuse, if someone has dealt with molestation, if someone has dealt with rape, if someone has dealt with incest, you cannot quote these ayahs and hadiths to that person. You can't go to someone who's dealt with major abuse, major verbal abuse, major physical abuse, major sexual abuse, any, any, any sexual abuse for that matter, especially that category. You can't go to that person and tell them, you know, Allah says, No, 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 no. That is, that is the wrong thing. No, that is the wrong thing. Take the example of Sayyidina Ibrahim, Prophet Ibrahim. Not just anyone, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam in Surah Maryam, he's doing da'wah to his father and he's inviting him uh, to Islam, you could say. He's inviting him to, to worship God alone and to not associate any partners with him. And he's doing so with amazing adab and love and respect and kindness. Ya abati, ya abati, ya abati. Oh my father, oh my father. And abati is like, like a super respectful term. So this is how he's trying to get through to his, to his dad. And it gets to the point where his dad responds to him by telling him, leave me alone. If you don't leave me alone, then I will kill you. What did Prophet Ibrahim do? Did he dig his heels into the ground and did, and did he insist on maintaining communication and staying in his father's presence? No. He just, he bounced, put it that way. He left and he never saw his father again. Why did he do that? To protect himself. To protect himself from an abusive father. Put it that way. We need to keep this in mind because Unfortunately, a lot of the time in the Muslim community, people go to abuse children and put pressure on them instead of putting pressure on the abusive parent. SubhanAllah, how things have become twisted. You don't go to the abused child who's dealt with major abuse 
I just gave some examples and tell them, oh, you need to forgive. And, you know, you need to wish them Ramadan Mubarak. And if you don't forgive, then God won't forgive you. You're going to go to someone and tell someone who's gone through extreme abuse that if they don't say Ramadan Mubarak, they're sinful before God. If that's your approach, then you need to fear God. That's not right. Right? You're, 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 uh, uh, what's the, what's the word? You're, um, uh, you're, you're, ba you're basically taking things out of context and you're, you're twisting things uh, into something that, um, that they're not. I can't think of the term, mutilate. You're mutilating the text if that's, if that's what you're doing. You don't go to someone abused and mutilate the text and say, look, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, hold on. You go to the abuser, hold them accountable. Not so many people do that. Think about that, notice that. Right, so why is it that at times in the Muslim community, it's far easier, and th this is like horrible to even say it, but it's far easier for someone to go and put pressure on the abused as opposed to on the abuser. SubhanAllah, the, the things they need to change. You don't go and put pressure on the abused. If someone was molested by a parent, you're going to go and tell that person, oh, if you don't forgive them, you're not going to be forgiven. A'udhu billah. Fear Allah. That, that's, that, that, that's not right. That's beyond twisted. And you wonder why there are so many people leaving Islam. Because they're told, oh, this is Islam. You have to keep ties and you have to go and visit them. And it's, Subhanallah. It's twisted. It's sick and twisted. That's not right. So I, I give that disclaimer because we need to understand these different references in context. These different references are regarding healthy situations. These different references are regarding like good positive situations, right? So when we look at, and this is um, what I was getting to earlier, when we look at the verses in Surah Isra, Allah says, worship God alone and be good to your parents. Uh, the, tra the translation here says, your Lord has decreed that you worship none but him and do good to parents. If any, if any one of them or both of them reach old age, do not say to them, oof, a word of uh, or expression of anger or contempt and do not scold them and address them with respectful words and submit yourself before them in humility out of compassion and say, my Lord, be merciful to them as they have brought me up in my childhood. Clearly, this is talking about a really awesome situation. So imagine there are these amazing parents and they're just they're there for their kids in general, especially from day one, especially when they're young. They're there throughout and they're present and they're consistent, good, awesome, like a healthy dynamic. No question the person should make this dua. There's a huge difference between someone going through extreme pain because of their parents. And then on the other side of someone is like, you know, oh my God, I turned 16 and like, you know, my parents, I totally hate them. I'm not talking to them again. Why? Well, you know, they got me like a red BMW instead of the blue Mercedes that I wanted for my 16th birthday. I hate them. I'm never talking to them clear difference between the two right so think of think of a healthy situation think of like Luqman and his son look at the love and respect and compassion and kindness and mentorship and and the 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 overall health that's infused in that relationship subhanallah that's awesome that's ideal should Luqman's son make this dot for him yes in that example right notice something though the dua is basically asking Allah, the child is asking Allah to treat their parents based on how they were treated by their parents. So, and that's built into the dua. Ya Allah, because they were good to me, I ask you to be good to them. Kama So it's built into these ayat. It's understood automatically from these ayat that these were good parents. They were present parents. They were not abusive parents. They were really awesome to their kids through and through, right? Consistently. Okay, so as that, that child grows up, should they make this dua? Absolutely, without question. This is the ideal situation. This is what we strive for, and this is what we hope for. And if there's something other than that, so you ha again, you have the norm, and then you have the exception. So this is regarding this. It would be nice if this was the norm, but we'll just we'll, uh, look at it in that way. This is generally speaking, so you have the general and the specific. This is the general. 
And then whenever there's abuse, it automatically becomes something specific. It depends um, on the, the details in that situation. And again, that's something that needs to be traversed, that needs to be unpacked, um, uh, ideally with a, a really good, awesome Muslim therapist, if possible. Uh, and if, if, if it's not possible to speak with a, a legit Muslim therapist, then, then any legit therapist uh, you trust who, who would be culturally sensitive and, and familiar with, with the type of, uh, to at least be familiar with your cultural background and your religious background so they can understand uh, where it is uh, you're coming from, and coming from. And for all the, the legit Muslim therapists out there, may Allah bless you, may Allah bless them. You serve the community in ways that literally no one else can. And you do awesome work and it makes a huge, huge difference. I say this firsthand as an imam, it makes a huge difference. You make a huge difference, really. Because here's the thing, just like you're aware of a lot of the, the, the ugly side of the community, as am I and, and any other imam out there, right? So from that standpoint, you are appreciated and we definitely need more Muslim therapists. We need more legit Muslim therapists who are good people, who, are, uh, uh, who, who understand Islam and they try their best to practice Islam. And, and there's this really awesome harmony going on. That, that's like a unicorn, right? God, God bless them. Um, the, the, the work they do, it makes a huge difference, really. A huge, huge difference. Um, and you know, we sincerely ask Allah to reward them for their efforts and to accept uh, their contributions to the community. And we ask Allah to protect them from burnout and to facilitate a lot of goodness for them and to help them in their self-care and to, um, to guide them in their paths and to help them to last long-term, inshallah, because there's such a need, because there's such a positive impact uh, that, that, uh, that they have on the community. Uh, and, and any stigma related to therapy has to go. That has to go. You have so many people out there with so much pain, but then they don't go to therapy because of this ridiculous um, foolish stigma that has to go and we need to be the change right as a generation as people these days we need to be the change and we need to like if, if a friend opens up to us and says hey i've been going to therapy for the last few months and you know this and that the response from us should not be oh my god you're going to therapy what's wrong with you you know like are you crazy or what have you no 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 instead that should be validated that should the response should be one of validation and kindness and compassion. We just talked about being soft spoken, being kind with our words and the value of that with Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, the uh, let's see here, the, the last thing uh, mentioned here. Uh, a a uh, Sahabi relates that they were once sitting with the Prophet when a person from from a certain tribe came to him and asked, O Messenger of Allah, is there any remaining act of kindness towards my parents which I can show them after their demise, after they've passed away? The Prophet, <coughs> excuse me, the Prophet وسلم, said, Yes, making dua for them, seeking forgiveness on their behalf, fulfilling their promises, maintaining ties of kinship which, which can only be reached through them, and honoring. Uh, their friends. In this hadith, the Prophet, the commentary in this hadith, the Prophet وسلم, taught methods one can practice throughout his life to attain the virtue of kindness towards one's deceased parents. And for whoever, uh, for whoever's parents have passed away, we ask Allah to forgive them. We ask Allah to bestow uh, His mercy upon them. We ask Allah uh, for all of us. We ask Allah to help us to take these action items and to put them into practice as best we can. We ask Allah to turn all of our hardships into ease. And for anyone out there who has uh, deep pain, severe pain in general, but especially if it's something that came from a family member, especially if it's a parent, we ask Allah to heal that pain. And we ask Allah to replace it with peace. Amni Rabbil Alameen. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Azzati Amma Yasifoon. Wassalamun ala al-Mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.